Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining for the DDU teaching. Uh, sorry again to miss last week. Um, it's just one of those things. And we'll talk about this week about the patients that are difficult to wean from mechanical ventilation. And what I'll do is we'll go through, I've got sort of three cases, each sort of showing something different, because uh, I think this is quite an interesting topic. And then we'll just sort of delve into bits as we go. And I'll pick on people as we go through, if that's all right. So why don't we start off with our... Uh, Okay, uh, so we've got a 63-year-old female who's difficult to wean from mechanical ventilation. I can't remember exactly why she was ventilated, um, but that's not the main issue. So I'm sorry if I don't have all the details because it was back in 2017, I think, this case. Um, and why don't we just start with these two? Let's say that she was, um, Arnie, if you're happy to kick this off, let's say this lady was intubated for urosepsis or something. She had uh, hypotensive, uh, intubated because she's a bit old and a bit delirious. And then she, uh, and then we're four days later, she's off ionotropic support and we're trying to extubate her now. So Arnie, take us, take us through this. Um, so there's an apical poor chamber view. Um, the dual screen with some color on the uh, right hand side with a scale that uh, looks appropriate. Um, unfortunately, clips play a little bit slow for me. So, the, the outstanding features are the this uh, gigantic or very large H by atrial enlargement. Mm -hmm. uh, the intraatrial septum maybe is a little bit bowed to the right side. Excellent. Um, it's uh, there is mitral regurgitation, sort of in that scenario. That, that, uh, that makes me always very worried. Um, it's I would say it's at least moderate. The the jet is uh, sort of almost going along the wall a little bit. Is it maybe even going into the pulmonary vein there? So it. Uh, you know, is there a possibility that severe would also be interested what her uh, loading conditions are, what she's otherwise like? Is she still hyper hypotensive and then maybe become she hyper, is not hypertensive? Hyper, she's not hypotensive any longer. So you said some really interesting things I would just sort of talk a little bit about. Start with a simple one. You said that the interatrial septum could be pushed over to the right. What, what does that mean to you? And uh, of course, I know it's a simple thing, but just start. Just take us through all through it. Well, so you, you told me that she's she's failing uh, from ventilation, uh, so that could be it's multiple difficult, things. Difficult to wean from it. So each difficult time to we, wean. Yeah, so difficult to wean. Each time we're trying to reduce the peep. Each time we're trying to reduce the FiO two. Uh, we have we have some difficulty. Uh, uh, she becomes tachypneic and things like that. So diff difficult to wean. On pressure support, trying to pull pull the yeah. ventilation settings down, tachypnea, and I, I'm going to say notice the tachycardia. So again, see everything that's going on. So she's tachycardic as well. Okay, so so I'm definitely uh, to, uh, to answer your question. I'm worried about um, increased left atrial filling pressures and the bow, the bowing intraatrial septum would be one of them. The enlarged atrium, of course, would be important to know whether that's long-standing mitral regurgitation, whether that has changed to previous. Beautiful. Uh, compared we, we to other have, echoes, um, get get more effect. views to 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 assess it. What's her volume status? Nice. So talk to me about the volume status. So first, uh, sorry, we'll come on to the volume status. The other thing you were talking about was they said that this mitral regurgitation worries you. And just delve into more. I completely agree with you, but uh, you said you thought it was moderate. But why, uh, talk to me again. T tell me a bit more about why this is worrying you. Um, sorry, I'm trying. I'm trying to I mean, follow the clips here on the two D. So I, I would. Uh, I would. I would assess for any morphology abnormality of the valve, which I don't see much of. Yeah, um, fantastic. But I agree. Uh, what, uh, you're, you're on exactly the right track. I guess what I'm trying to get to is, 
Um, if, if we start talking about severity, all I'm showing you here is color Doppler. And color Doppler is not going to give you the whole story, is it? Because color Doppler just tells you about right. blood flow. And to get blood flow, you have to have a pressure difference. And if you've got massively elevated left atrial That's pressure, right. exactly as you've suggested in this, all I'd expect, uh, I guess all I was trying, trying to fish out, and forgive me if I'm sort of playing the game of what am I thinking, but it was that you could grossly underestimate the severity of the mitral regurge based on color Doppler alone in this scenario. Um, and that's because we yes. got a big left atrium that's, that's over, that, that has likely got some raised left atrial pressure. So my next questions to you are gonna be, you talk about the fluid status, you talk about the volume status. What do you, how do you assess volume status? Uh, particularly if someone's overloaded, because I guess we're worried that this lady is overloaded. So, uh, of course, there's one is the clinical bedside assessment. Um, uh, then, uh, it, depending on what ventilation mode she is, I could try to do some uh, measurements, but they're all probably, you know, the, the, the volume, clinical volume assessment probably would trump everything here and that someone with that degree of MR, uh, I, I would always be worried that they have, uh, have too much fluid on board, uh, yeah, depending exactly. as well what the history was, how she ended up intubated. I uh, also noted that the, the RV maybe also looks a little bit big. The right atrium is also big. I would want to see what degree of TR is there. Uh, right. Of course, have a look at the IVC um, and uh, then go from there. Fantastic. Really nice. Thanks, Tony. That's really great. So just to summarize about what that, the learning points from this one in particular I was showing you this is that, um, so first of all, the uh, left ventricle looks relatively, from what we've got here, it looks relatively normal in size with normal systolic function. But the big striking abnormalities is that massive left atrium, interatrial septum pushed over to the right, suggesting raised left atrial pressure. And it's likely really raised left atrial pressure because the both of the atria are significantly dilated, uh, which suggests biatrial dilation, but still the left atrium is trumping that by, by the interatrial septum pushed over to the, to the right. And the second thing is with that color Doppler, it looks like it could be quite significant mitral regurg based on this alone, but it's likely we're still underestimating it because of the severity of the left atrial pressure. You know, I think we can see that there's probably a significant uh, PISA that's potentially being formed from that central jet that's coming back through and it's hitting the back wall, all of which suggesting that maybe this could be a fluid overloaded state. So uh, excellent. No, um, and then the final thing you talked about was the dilated right ventricle. So really nice. Okay. Um, Lee, do you want to have a, uh, we'll go for the next, uh, the next person if that's okay. So Lee, so if you've got this, we're, we're worried about raised left atrial pressure in a potentially volume overloaded state. What other measurements would you want to have a look at? Let's stick with the left atrium, left atrial pressure. What other measurements would you want to assess for left atrial pressure elevation? Um, you could look at the, the Doppler from the pulmonary venous return to see if there's um, ventricular systolic, uh, essentially during ventricular systole, if you get flow reversal up the pulmonary veins, yep. um, which could, that's a marker of severe mitral regurge. Very nice. Uh, How about if it looks like that? Sorry, what? How about if it looks like that? So that's the, that's the pulmonary vein that you were asking about. So what do we see on this one? <laughs> um, so uh, Using the, the ECG at the bottom to so, sort of look at timing. Very nice. Uh, right, so I mean, during, during systole, it doesn't look like there's a lot of flow reversal like we've got uh, I actually so but then there's rapid so going from early uh, early filling uh, you can see there's a rapid descent so there's uh, that suggests that there's rapid equalization of pressures from the pulmonary veins to the in the yeah, atrial I'm gonna say, there might be there might be a little bit more we're thinking about so things like severe AR and severe MR but this is the, again this is the pulmonary vein flow so just you're on the right track the way we look at the 
So systole from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. And yeah. here we've got what's known as the S wave, systolic wave. The next wave is during diastole. So from the end of the T wave, so the beginning of the P wave, that's the D wave, the diastolic wave. And then yeah. just after that, you often get this A wave uh, or the A wave reversal associated normally with the P wave. And what we're seeing here is the S wave is much smaller than the D wave. And that tells us that we've got some form of raised left atrial pressure. And you're absolutely right, though, if it's systolic flow reversal, that often goes uh, underneath the wave and associated with severe mitral regurge. So this might suggest that maybe the pulmonary vein that we're looking at here doesn't have it. So maybe we're dealing with the moderate mitral regurge, such as Arnie was suggesting in the last one. I think probably if we've got this raised left atrial pressure, uh, we've still got to think that potentially we're underestimating it, but I think it's probably in the moderate category is, is my gut feeling. But this is a marker with the S wave less than the D wave. We call it systolic blunting, if you like, and systolic blunting associated with raised left atrial pressure. Cool? Yeah. No, so you're on the right track. What about these other ones? What am I showing with these other three pictures? So as well as the pulmonary veins, we're also going to look at the tissue Doppler imaging yeah. on your medial and your lateral mitral annulus. And then we're also going to look at our E-wave velocity. Um, so, uh, so for the for, for images nineteen and twenty, tissue Doppler, we can see that the the lateral is tissue Doppler is supposed to be a higher velocity than the medial one, which it yep. is. Yeah. Uh, cool. If that's reversed, you worry about sort of restrictive, uh, which. Uh, reasons for raised left atrial pressures. Um, we've got... So yeah, so we're looking at the E over E prime in particular would be a big one. So if we've got an E wave of about one and E, uh, e primes are sitting there only about 12 as an average. You getting me? So if we do call, call the mitral E wave velocity one meter per second, yeah, we divide that by the average between the medial and the lateral E prime. So here it's the first blip down during diastole. So it's that value there, which is eight, and this value here that's fourteen. Can you see that? Are you moving your mouse? I can't see what you're pointing uh, to. Sorry. So in in, mark, in number nineteen, the E wave, uh, the E prime, excuse me, is uh, on the medial mitral annulus is. Eight, yeah, the top right image and the bottom left image, we got an E prime of about 14. So if we yeah. take the average of the two of them, so I call it 12 centimeters a second, or if we're doing a meters per second, 0.12 meters per second. And then the E wave uh, here in the bottom right hand image, uh, we've got an E to A ratio of three, and we've got uh, an E wave velocity of only of one meter per second. So what, what, Values would suggest raised left atrial pressure there. I'd be guessing. Sorry. So we'll start with the E to E prime. Have you heard about the E to E prime? It's it's the difference between this E wave value here, the uh, early uh, inflow to the left ventricle, and you take that as a ratio between an average between the other two. Uh, I've heard of the ratios. I don't know. I don't have the numbers on the tip of my Beautiful. tongue. I'll just I'll quickly flick through the numbers because they're worth remembering. Okay, because they're, they're these are the, they're important ones. Some of them not so important. These ones are definitely important. So the E wave, bottom right picture. So E of one, divided by an average of the other two E prime, which is done with tissue Doppler, gives you a ratio. Okay, anything less than eight is considered normal left atrial pressure. Eight to fifteen. Who knows, kind of gray zone. Greater than 15 is raised left atrial pressure. So unfortunately for this, for this uh, lady, she sits in a bit of the gray zone with the E to E prime. But, but, the uh, it's a uh, nine thing. Uh, this, but this ratio that we have here, the E to A ratio of three, again, points more towards the significant diastolic dysfunction, maybe grade three diastolic dysfunction, that I think means we have to take everything into account. And she does have significant tricuspid regurge as well, I should say, which again points to more than more significant end of the diastolic dysfunction. And with a big left atrium, intraatrial septum pushed over, I think this points to significantly raised left atrial pressure. Hmm. Okay. 
with that mitral regurge and everything that Arnie was saying, I think points this lady potentially, and I should also maybe show you this. Let's show you. Nice, big, dilated, plethoric IVC. Mm. I think starts all pointing towards the idea that maybe this lady is a bit fluid overloaded, having been over resuscitated potentially. We've got mm. raised left atrial pressure, which means that we are in difficulty when we start reducing her, uh, reducing her ventilation settings of being uh, of making things worse, which is why she's potentially failing her weaning process because potentially she's fluid overloaded with some diastolic dysfunction and some raised left atrial pressure. Okay. And so this would be the kind of patient that we should look towards diuresis. Why? Uh, okay, so did everyone hear that question? No. So the question was, would you do a passive leg raising maneuver uh, to assess the lady's fluid status, you mean? Yeah, just to see whether it's negative. If it's negative, you should get the fluid. Yeah, nice. So just uh, speak up a little bit so everyone can hear. So I, I completely agree. So not, not particularly. I mean, I think fluid, the passive leg raising maneuver, for, for me, is about testing whether someone is fluid responsive, not to see whether they're fluid overloaded. And I think I'm only going to care about someone if they're fluid responses, if I want to increase up their stroke volume. And if this lady is being weaned from the ventilator and we're looking towards extubation, she's not in shock. We do not need to elevate her stroke volume, so we do not need to give her any fluid. And also, I don't know about any evidence to talk about how someone is fluid overloaded with the passive leg raising maneuver. But I think, just as Arnie was saying, I think it's clinical. Different in that this patient is still shocked. Absolutely, that, that's, that's different. That's very so, different. Absolutely, but that's a fluid responsiveness rather than a yes. volume status. All right. I hope everyone heard that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hope so. Um, Sam, Sam, can I ask a question? It's Danielle hi, here. Danielle, Sorry, nice late you, as hi. usual. Missed the start. <laughs> Saw the big atria. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what rhythm do you think she's in? I think she's in sinus rhythm. Consistently. No, that's a great question. Show me the EAs I mean, again. I think that looks like a pretty good S and D wave. Yeah. And where is her? You know, if you look at her E prime, I think e. we've got an E and okay. A wave. Okay, yep. Yeah, good question about there. She's pretty Just good. Just because when I was looking at the EAs, I wasn't sure how many A's you can really see. Yeah, nice. I mean, I think, I think she's in sinus rhythm, but also she's got a heart rate of 100, so we may be getting some ENA fusion going on. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, she's quite fast, but then you've got one there. So yep. if you can see one definite A wave, you're happy then to interpret your EA ratio? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably the best that we've got there. I think yep. that's, I'm happy with that one. Yeah, yep, yep. I wouldn't be so happy on this third and fourth. Yeah, yep. cycle. Okay, thank you. And I guess it's trying to put it all together. You I know? mean, that atria suggests that she's having some AF Maybe. at times, doesn't uh, it? You know, that could be a reason for having two very dilated atria. Yeah. I think, I, I guess I'm trying to use this to, as an example of how difficult sometimes I find looking at that volume overloaded status. Yeah. Um, and this is really, and the volume status is particularly important when we're trying to wean someone who's old and crumbly from the ventilator, who's got significant diastolic dysfunction. So that's what this case is all about. Some with diastolic dysfunction, even though we've got normal systolic dysfunction, I think we've got significant, probably severe diastolic dysfunction, raised left atrial pressure. This is something we definitely need to diarese to try and get them off the ventilator. I think there's some other thing that we could do that might be better way of trying to determine the volume status in the passive leg raising. Can you give me another one, Louise? Can I? Oh. Sorry, oh, yeah. uh, will you do lung ultrasound and look for a B-wave? My man, thank you very much indeed. So that'll be bringing on to the next case, which we'll bring on, and Swapnil can take us through that one. Perfect. All right, so here we've got a 71-year-old lady who has recently failed extubation because of pulmonary edema, and she's just been re-intubated. So why don't you take us through this one, Swapnil? Oh, you mean me? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you brought up lung ultrasound, buddy. Jeez. Uh, 
Well, this is not the, these are not the best pictures. Yeah, you should have kept your mouth shut. <laughs> uh, I'll pass it on, Sam. You want to pass it on? Uh, Danielle, do you want to crack? So right. this thing's just failed extubation, getting re-intubated. Okay. So I think what we are looking at here is a, um, a kind of a zoomed out uh, uh, view with a lot of depth of a um, parasternal long axis. Yeah. Um, because what I can see is the, um, the RVOT anteriorly there um, with the LV, the LA, um, and then behind this, a large echo-free um, area, um, which I think is likely to be a large um, pleural effusion. I yeah. think that the um, echo dense, echo free area, um, pardon me, is um, lying behind the descending aorta, which would make it a pleural effusion rather than a pericardial effusion. Beautiful. This is almost getting up to sort of seven and it's, it's very large. So it's yep. huge. I don't think we'll get um, pericardial effusions this Yeah, I'm surprised that anyone tried to extubate her, honestly. Yeah, fantastic. I'm not <laughs> sure. I, it, was, it could have been me, but I do hope not. I, um, absolutely. So this is a massive pleural effusion that's sitting behind the heart swapnel. And so the, the big sort of key point and the reason why I'm showing even though the pictures are a bit dodgy is you can sort of see the heart flapping around at the front and we've obviously got this huge depth to this screen because I'm trying to show this. Now, the reason I got confused is I, the, in the middle of the aorta, descending aorta, it looks like there's some white like kind of hypericoic shadow there and I was like is it the aorta, like is it the parasonal short axis? Oh sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah I mean I know it's a bit dodgy. It's a, I mean that's the aorta up there, left atrium sitting in there and there is the descending aorta. And so this is a big sort of black space. And so normally we don't see anything behind it here. And if anything, normally it's just sort of a big, horrible gray shadow right from the lung. Mm -hmm. So Danielle's absolutely right. We're picking up. Nice, nice. So let's, so why don't we just, uh, we'll jump through and we'll bring in the lung a bit better. So I guess maybe I'll show you this picture here. This makes assessment of left atrial pressure, I think, a little bit harder sometimes. Can you see the, just try and turn that up. There's quite a lot of thickening to the mitral valve, a lot of mitral annular calcification. And you can see straight away how, uh, how sort of impaired the movement of the mitral annulus is. And mitral annular calcification, when it's significant, is a, is a bit of a bugger when you're starting to try and assess the E wave. So the E and the, uh, oh, sorry, looking at the tissue Doppler. So looking at things like the E primes and the E and the A ratio, sometimes I think you've got to be a bit careful with. And that's why we're going to use what Arnie was talking about, looking at our left atrial size, looking at the interatrial septum, looking at the pulmonary vein flows, which I think I've got. You know, pulmonary vein flows, uh, such as Lee was describing here. And we can see our systolic wave, See the S wave here, it's a little bit smaller than our D wave and we've got some form of systolic blunting, again suggesting raised left atrial pressures going on. And this, just as, uh, just as Swapnil was saying before, makes me want to go and look at the lung ultrasound. So Swapnil, how about you have a look at these guys and tell me what you think. Sorry, I was just having a think. Okay. Sorry guys, it's coming. Okay, so swap now, we've got our left yeah. upper zone anterior, left middle zone anterior, and then the sort of auxiliary area. So talk me through all of those ones. So you can clearly see uh, multiple B lines is in left um, upper lobe anterior and lip, left middle lobe mid axillary, um, nice. and then you also can see a large pleural effusion with collapsed lung, uh, especially on the left middle anterior. Yep. Um, and yeah, so basically combination of large pleural effusion with collapsed lung with pulmonary edema. Very nice. And we've got the same on the other side if we have a look at. Yeah, so again, uh, large pleural effusion uh, collapse. So, yeah, so bilateral 
you're really um, And so, I, using this as an example to suggest that if we're suggesting someone is in that volume overloaded state, I think the lung ultrasound can be really useful in this category. And if you've got someone who's got an echo picture like the first one, you've got B lines everywhere. I, I think you know with that significant mitral regurg, there's significant tricuspid regurg. That's really got to point you to think this patient's volume overloaded. We shouldn't be extubating them. Uh, and we should be diureasing them before we have a crack at that. Um, so let me just pull it back a little bit and talk a little about heart-lung interactions first. So, Amory, talk to me about when we extubate someone, what effect does that have on the heart? Why do these patients who are volume overloaded with diastolic dysfunction get re-intubated? Because we have people walking around that maybe have images that look like this when they come into hospital and they don't get intubated. But why is this different with a lady who's intubated with these things who we then extubate? What's, what's the problem? What's, what happens when we extubate someone from a heart-lung interaction point of view? Um, so in particular, the left ventricle, the left ventricle um, like pinch, which Nice. And we can't hear. Oh, sorry. I'll just bring it forward in a sec. Oh, sorry. Can you hear us now? So that the, the uh, Amory was saying that the uh, the left ventricle likes PEEP, likes increased positive pressure in the chest, and when we take someone, uh, and sorry, the positive pressure on the chest reduces your preload and your afterload. And your afterload. Uh, for the left heart, yes, for the left heart. So and it does that because uh, do you remember the afterload equation? No, I don't. And speak up so just everyone can hear. No minus. Uh, um, means filling pressure or pressure. Okay. I was meaning the, the, the equation I'm thinking of talks about wall stress. So I think it's the taking it back to a physiological uh, perspective. And wall stress was equivalent to the pressure difference across the left ventricle times by the radius divided by the wall thickness. But the big part there is that the pressure difference between so if the LV has got a pressure say of 120 and on positive pressure the pressure is say 5 or 10 when we extubate someone you do reduce both of the pressures but the pulmonary the pleural pressure reduces much more yeah so it's that difference that if you're being mechanically ventilated the difference between the two of them is say that much when you then extubate them it's that much so, and that's afterload. That difference is the afterload. So it's much greater afterload when you extubate someone. Yeah. yeah. You got it, because it's all about the transmural pressure across the ventricle. So if you make afterload worse, you then make diastolic function worse, you make left atrial pressure worse, you make your pulmonary edema worse. So that's why it takes about an hour for people to go into pulmonary edema when you extubate them. So if I was going to answer a, a question in the DDU if there's something came up because I think this is a great question because it if you can answer this then you know about heart lung interactions and you know about diastolic dysfunction uh, if, if the question was you know what patients are at risk of failure to be extubated I'd have said it's patients who are fluid overloaded have got raised left atrial pressure with significant diastolic dysfunction those that have significant systolic dysfunction because by definition those guys also have diastolic dysfunction uh, and those are probably the main ones, you know, or those with significant mitral regurge, I think, and aortic regurge, yeah. So I think those are the, the groups that I'd be particularly worried about. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about the pulmonary hypertension. So what's extubation going to do? Why is the pulmonary hypertension a risk factor? So again, the same process happens because with the post pressure ventilation, you are increasing the you are decreasing the uh, cardiac payload because of the decrease in post pressure. Nice. And this ends up with less pressure gradient across the right side of the heart and reducing the pulmonary pressure. Do you guys hear this? You okay? Yeah. Can we hear it? Oh, sorry, no one can hear. So it's just saying that the um, with the uh, positive pressure, you reduce the preload to the right atrium. So you're reducing the preload that's going into the right side of the heart. Beautiful. Yep. And then it's not the pressure. 
So we're saying that when you're ventilating someone, you can reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance. And definitely you can improve their oxygenation and the uh, hypercardia. Yeah. So for that as, as well, you are optimizing the right ventricular pressure and the pulmonary artery pressure as well. And uh, whenever you are excavating such patients, you are reversing all this, so it leads to compromise nice. of their uh, pulmonary ventilation. So if we're talking, it's all, it's all correct. So if we're talking about the risk of, of extubating patients, we must uh, take into account what the effects are having on both sides of the heart. So on the right side of the heart, we will reduce their preload. We can increase their afterload with the positive pressure, but we're also gonna help open up areas of the lungs, improve hypoxia, improve, hyper improve hypercarbia, and that will help prevent, uh, uh, you know, increased pulmonary vascular resistance. And on the left side of the heart, we will reduce the afterload with positive pressure ventilation. So when we take someone off the ventilator, we will thereby increase it. Cool. All right. Should we do the last case? Are there any questions before we move on? So that's, that's really important for some of that. All right. Danielle, do you want to have a crack at something a bit out of left field? Oh, who, oh, sorry, no, hang, 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 hang. You know, you've got my, where is, who else have we got on the screen? Was Lewis McLean there? Was Lewis still there? There he is. <laughs> Hello, mate. I've had five phone calls so far in this 25-minute uh, shoot. Can we, can we be your number six? <laughs> I have a look at this. This one's, um, uh, this one's uh, a little bit more esoteric, but I still think it's really interesting, okay? I don't know if you've seen this one. Okay, um, this was a guy who was, how old is he? He's 1941, that makes him 79 years old. He just had uh, lung surgery and he was really difficult to wean from the ventilator. Each time he turned down his peep or um, turned down his pressure support, he'd become really, really tachypneic. So we went and had a look at his heart, which is kind of normal. Um, so I'll just sort of, slightly bad pictures and forgive me if they are uh, because he wasn't super easy to scan because he just had lung surgery but you can get the idea here that we've got a normal left ventricle size normal right ventricle size and the atria look okay yeah he did not have diastolic dysfunction uh, I'll show you that just so you believe me uh, so we've got an E to A ratio that's less than one. Yeah. And we've got, hang on. And we've got E prime averages sitting there of about say eight or something. So not, so not the best, uh, so maybe some form of him, mildly impaired sort of uh, relaxation issues because yep. that E prime is less than 12 on the lateral and less than 10 on the medium. But left atrial pressure by sort of standard diagnosis would not be saying it was elevated. But this guy was really tricky to wean from the ventilator. So just like Swapnil was saying, we wants to go and have a look at the lung ultrasound. So let me give you... Let's try this. So I'm going to say that on the diaf on the X-ray though, the left diaphragm looks high. So this guy's on he's on pressure support ventilation, so he's breathing spontaneously. Okay. They're a bit dodgy, but you get the idea that the so this is left, the bottom left is the left upper quadrant. And then yeah, let's just start with that. What, what are you seeing on this? So uh, it's a, somewhat hard to interpret. Yeah, fair but, enough. We're a bit crap. It gets better. But uh um look in the left and right upper zones it looks like there's more than three b lines okay in each um in each uh sector there 
Yep. So that would be consistent with interstitial syndrome. Cool. Uh, I think the lower, the L-U-Z-M-A, what's that left upper zone? Medaxillary. Uh, Medaxillary. Uh, that's possibly confluent B lines that you're seeing there, but... Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not confluent from this, but maybe have a look at this one. So this is in the upper quadrant mid axillary line. So it's sitting there right up sort of where you'd expect the lower part of the lung to be. How about that? Yep. Uh, I'd probably like a bit more depth. Um, yeah, fair enough. And may, maybe, that's, maybe that's an air bronchogram there in the uh, yeah, left no. side of the middle sector. Exactly, exactly what it sort of is meant to look like. And I agree it's not perfect, but it doesn't look like normal lung. And it looks, if anything, like some sonographic hepatization. Is there some form of collapse or atelectasis going on there? Yeah, so I think there might be consolidation on that side. Beautiful. And what I want to have a look at is this. Let's start with the right side. Okay, so this is a linear probe. There's a rib there, and there's a rib there. What's this bit at the bottom here? So this is in your right diaphragm. So it's about the mid axillary, uh, anterior, uh, anterior axillary line at about the eighth or the ninth intercostal space. Um. Just have a look between those two white lines there. As that, as he, as that patient breathes in, it thickens. Okay. Well, it, the structure you're describing to me is probably the diaphragm. Very nice. Um, I think with the eye of faith, I can probably see it thickening. Yeah, so just watch it, particularly, I guess, over here. As he breathes in, that thickens. You can measure this at end expiration yeah. versus end inspiration. I find this a little tricky because you see we're talking about sort of the difference of 0.1 of a millimeter here. Mm-hmm which is always a bit punchy when we're talking about ultrasound measuring these things, I think. But if you have a look, sorry, let me go back. Now this is the left diaphragm. Now, I don't know how well this comes out for you guys. I'll just see. Yeah, this is the best one I got. So these two lines here are the same that we were looking at on the other side of this guy's chest. And first of all, if you measure it, you can see that they're a lot, it's a lot thinner than it was on the right side. So the right side was about three millimeters. This one's just about like one and a half. And again, it's small, small uh, sizes we're talking about. But this, if you can see that when this patient starts to try to breathe in, it doesn't move at all. There's no thickening that goes on in that diaphragm. And this is one of the ways that we can start assessing diaphragm function. And you can compare one side to the other and you see that that right ventricle is moving normally. This one is not moving at all. A second way that we can potentially see is this guy's just had thoracic surgery. Uh, don't forget. So maybe I can try and actually compare these if it works. Uh, he'd had uh, thoracic surgery done for Oh, I can't remember now. Was it a left upper lobectomy or something? Something that injured the phrenic nerve. Well, no, I spoke to the surgeons. They said there's no way it got injured. Yeah, no way. There's no way the phrenic nerve got injured. I was, it's, totally, it's, it's impossible. There's no way. Just, no, no, no. Yeah, it was just, but it's just the difference in those two there. So with the linear probe, you can look at the thickening of the diaphragm. And this guy collapsed on the left side. That wasn't moving well. And I, I don't know how well it comes out, guys, but you just you get the idea that hopefully that the diaphragm. There we go. So I'm just trying to compare those two bits that are moving versus those two bits that are moving. OK. That's the first way of doing it. And the second way is by this. Okay, so in lung ultrasound, if you use your echo probe and you go underneath the rib cage on the right, so pointing up towards the chest, and so again, so the mid-axillary line, you can see the liver here with the diaphragm is that bright white line. And this is on the right side. This is a normal diaphragm moving as someone breathes in and out. Because you breathe in, the diaphragm gets flattens out and so pushes down the liver. 
if you use M mode, you can put M mode through, uh, through the liver and you can have a look how this moves up with inspiration and back down. And you can see here on the right side, it's about three, four centimeters, okay? So that's just normal sort of tidal breathing. If you look at the right side, uh, sorry, look at the left side. So here's the spleen here, this bright white line that you can't see properly is the diaphragm. And as that patient tries to breathe in, there's no movement at all on the left side of the diaphragm. And again, putting M mode through it, it the left side's always a bit harder than the right. But here's the spleen, there's the diaphragm, and it's just not moving very well at all. And so you've got no diaphragm movement. So this is a sign of diaphragm dysfunction. So another reason why people fail ventilation, if particularly if they've been on ventilators for a long period of time. I use this as an example so that we can see a normal one and an abnormal one, which helps. But often both diaphragms get injured. And if you've been on ventilators for a full mandatory ventilation for a couple of days, there's evidence to say that your diaphragm dysfunction reduces by as much as 50%. So it's just something worth looking at in the long-term patients, particularly, I guess, who get stuck on ventilators, diaphragm ultrasound, is, uh, is that's an example of that. Yeah, sort of like a tapsy, yeah. A tapsy, a diaphragm <laughs> annular plane systolic excursion, breathing excursion. That's a great question. So the question was, you can't actually do anything about it. Um, I, I think they're, uh, they're not really. It makes you feel better. <laughs> we can diagnose it. Diaphragm pacing, I guess. I mean, I think the particular, I guess, with the long term patients, if we're using this, is maybe to see the ones that are at risk. I guess physiotherapy is the big thing. We can't do anything about this with this phrenic nerve palsy, but maybe you can do something about it with the long term patients in terms of physiotherapy. And prevention is probably better than uh, better than finding out about it too late down the track. Um, so I guess. That's that's sort of it. So maybe just a quick quick recap for the exam side of things. Can, so, can I just jump in there for one second? Oh, I, I think actually it makes a huge difference uh, knowing that you know the the threshold of doing a tracheostomy for me is much lower. Uh, you're not repeatedly trying to extubate him, um, particular if it, it's you know uh, just after surgery and it's one sided and you know they're struggling, you hope it's just neuropraxia and you may look after a few days or so, or if it's really a long, long standing thing or it will take weeks, then uh, after transplant or so, you know, the, the threshold to put a trachea in is, uh, is much lower for me and then to move them on. I guess all I'd, all, my only, <clears throat> I completely agree, my only comment would be is if you're not used to doing diaphragm dysfunction, it's a bit like uh, doing strain analysis that, it, you know, we're talking about really small numbers. It's, there's a certain fudge factor in this. So you probably see from these pictures and I show this case all the time because it's probably one of the better ones that we get, to be honest. It can be really hard to do diaphragm ultrasound, particularly if they both diaphragms aren't moving. So it takes a lot of practice. So if you are going to use that as part of your clinical, uh, clinical assessment, just practice on some normal ones and you sort of get the idea of what normal looks like and then you get an idea of what abnormal looks like. And it's not perfect, but the reference standard is fluoroscopy, which is also not bloody perfect either. You know, it's a lot of problems with that. So I, I think it's probably one of the better ways we've got of assessing the diaphragm. It just takes a little bit of practice and it's not as easy as doing a tap sleep. Yeah, it, it is difficult, but it's also difficult to rely on an right. ultrasound service to diagnose it. And they, they, they don't even turn the ventilator off and say, oh, the diaphragm is breathing. <laughs> the, the, the diaphragm is moving. It's all fine. I'll, I'll play that. So, it's a really great call talking about the diaphragm. So I have exactly the same problem where you've asked someone to have a look at it and they say, oh, it's moving loads. Then you turn off the diaphragm and it doesn't move at all, which is why you've got to look at the thickening. Because obviously the, the diaphragm will move with positive pressure ventilation, but it won't thicken if it's dysfunctional. So Trying to do both is useful. Um, just a question. Oh. Yeah, go, Lee. Uh, uh, my understanding is if you're going to do this assessment, you want zero pressure support as well. So you can actually see paradoxical. You want their breathing in spiratory efforts. That yeah. way, as they generate negative intrathoracic pressure, you'll actually get paradoxical diaphragm movement rather than moving the direct down like it's supposed to. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's absolutely, that makes physiological sense. Often when I'm looking after these 
if I'm doing it for that weaning process, I just, I try and take him down. You know, if it's not moving, if it's not thickening and it's moving, then I'll turn down the pressure support and the, uh, and the peep and try and see uh, if it stops. You just got to do it. I do it incrementally and just take it slowly because obviously, obviously these patients get short breath pretty fast. Mm. Yeah, a good call. So you're saying that if it's completely buggered, then you turn off the ventilator, you actually see it going in the other direction because they're going to be sort of having abdominal wall motion. So the paradox. Yeah, they, yeah as they generate negative intrathoracic pressure, yeah. the diaphragm is supposed to move down, and so they suck their volume out of the bad side. Yeah, good call. Good call. Thank you. Um, sorry, Louise asked. I was asking a question. So the question was, what position I do the diaphragm thickening? I, I normally sit them up at about 45 degrees. I go the anterior uh, auxiliary line. I go, I try and go perpendicular to the ribs. And uh, that's for the, uh, the linear, with the linear probe. And you're looking for, and if I can't find, I sort of just slide backwards or go upper rib. And you're looking for obvious sort of thickening of that diaphragm, two bright white lines. And then for the diaphragm excursion, as we call it, I try and use an abdominal probe if I can, but the echo probe sort of works. And you go uh, in maybe some more towards the posterior axillary line. So you're using the liver on the right to look at the diaphragm and the spleen on the left to look at the diaphragm. So use those two organs as your acoustic windows. And obviously have greater depth of about 15 centimeters. Or so. And Sam, what are the kind of numbers in terms of thickness or do you compare right versus left? So one of the biggest studies done as some, some guys out of the States called Andrea Boone, who's lovely. Uh, she did a study in some normals and at about 150 patients, I think it was. And she was suggesting that with tidal breathing, normal is somewhere between three to five centimeters. So normal for breathing pattern. And then if you were to take a deep breath, it goes up to about eight to 12 or 14. And the right moves a little bit more than the left, but they're kind of similar, sort of somewhere in the region of, say, uh, maybe 20% more on the right. So that's about the movement. Uh, what about the thickness? The thickening is, let me get this right. So the normal thickness is about three to five millimeters. And with breathing, it increases by anywhere between 30 to 70%. So I, you know, and we're talking small numbers, right? So I just, I kind of, I, I find it's better just to have an eyeball. And if you see it thickening, that's okay. If you, if, rather, if you don't see anything thickening, that's not good. You know, so it should thicken by about 50%. And the thickness is normally about three to five millimeters. But, you know, so it's, it's not perfect. I, I certainly won't stress that I think it's the be all and end all. But as Arnie was saying, it's kind of the best we've got. And... Uh, it's completely non-invasive and you can do it over and over again, obviously. Thanks, Sam. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, as I said, I think it's a really good thing to get your head around. It's the, these kind of questions we love in the DDU exam because it's everything. It mixes in clinical with echo images um, and sort of multiple like heart-lung interactions, diastolic dysfunction. You know, it feels like you, if you know this, then you can understand echo and it's, I think it takes quite a long time to get your head around. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a good subject to try and get your head around, I think. Okay, thanks guys, see you a bit later, thank you. Thanks, Tom.